Watch this. Yesterday's new COVID recommendations from the CDC had a lot of you fired up. So we took all of your coronavirus questions and comments to the experts. Well, 24 hours after the CDC released its updated guidelines, how are Idaho's entertainment venues responding? Do you need to pack your mask the next time you want to rock out at the Idaho Center? And fans of 80s rock and roll and MTV videos are mourning the loss of a legend today with the passing of Dusty Hill of ZZ Top. That sadness is a heavy burden for one Boise man who has these guitar gods to thank for his place in rock and roll history. Change seems to be the only consistent thing that we've seen over the past pandemic year and a half, and sometimes those changes come at us quickly. With COVID, we're now seeing changes to the playbook after the emergency of the Delta variant of the coronavirus. And it's common for viruses to change and adapt, and so we need to change and adapt as well, right? I mean, it's not rocket science, but it is medical science. And as I'm sure you've heard, there is new CDC guidance for mask usage for both vaccinated and non-vaccinated people. In response to that news, a lot of you wrote in with questions and some confusion. For example, what's behind the CDC thought process, specifically when it comes to breakthrough cases and the Delta variant? And what about those who say they are not getting the vaccine because, well, they believe they have natural immunity after getting the virus? For insight, Joe Paris spoke with Idaho medical expert Dr. David Pate and state epidemiologist Dr. Christine Hahn. We are definitely seeing uh, a rise in our cases. We're seeing a rise in the number of people in the hospitals. We're very worried. And we think the Delta variant is largely to blame. For months, there was speculation about what would happen if the coronavirus mutated into a more contagious virus. Experts believe we are now likely seeing the effects of that with the Delta variant, specifically with breakthrough cases. Those are cases when people are infected with COVID, even if they're fully vaccinated. We have been seeing more breakthrough cases, uh, but they tend to be milder. The good news is if you're vaccinated, uh, you may get Delta variant, but uh, almost none of those folks that are vaccinated are ending up really sick. They're not ending up in the hospital, uh, whereas our unvaccinated folks uh, have that same risk. Uh, that's who we're seeing end up in the hospital. Idaho medical expert Dr. David Pate says research shows new and concerning data on Delta variant and just how contagious it is even for fully vaccinated people. What we've seen with Delta is it's different that these folks that are getting infected have extremely high levels of virus in their nose, even though they're not sick. And so in fact, what the study showed was 1260 times more than a thousand times more virus in your nose. And so that's led the CDC and all of us to worry that this may be high enough virus that even though you're vaccinated, even though you won't get sick, you might be able to transmit it to somebody. In fact, it may be more dangerous because the fact that you are vaccinated, the fact that you don't get sick, you're carrying it around, you have no idea and then you do transmit it to somebody who's not vaccinated or somebody who is very vulnerable. For medical and community leaders, attention is again on increasing the percentage of people vaccinated. A common reason being cited by those choosing not to get the vaccine is the belief that they already have natural immunity from previously getting COVID. Experts have pushed back on that rationale. What advice or what, I guess, insight would you give to those people that are saying this vaccine isn't for me, I already had COVID? Well, my advice is get vaccinated and my insight is I understand and I understand what you're saying and you probably do have some immunity, but what it appears from studies, because we're actually looking now at the antibody levels, at the T cell responses in these folks that were previously infected. And while yes, you have some immunity, the amount of your immunity is less than if you get vaccinated the duration is less than if you get vaccinated and the ability of Delta, and who knows what's coming next, but the ability of Delta to get around your natural immunity is even higher than the ability to get around the uh, immunity from vaccination. So I don't dispute that you have some protection, but you don't have great protection. We have all learned to that natural immunity is a good thing, and it, can, it really can be. It, it protects us against all sorts of stuff. Uh, but with COVID it being so new, we don't really know that it's going to protect you against the Delta variant. Uh, if you got infected with another variant early on, this one you might be vulnerable to. 
in addition, we don't know how long natural immunity is going to last. We know natural immunity isn't a lifelong thing for all diseases. It's one reason why we have to get a flu shot every year or get tetanus boosters, right? There's some, there's some, um, something about immunity that tends to wear off over time. And it's worth pointing out again, Joe, this virus has only been around well, less than two years, so there's still a lot to learn about it. Okay, so we talked about the vaccine and what do we need to, or you were talking about that. What do we need to get to now in order for, I don't know, to make a change to this new protocol that we're seeing? Right, well, Dr. Pate pointed out something uh, very astutely that only 37% of all Idahoans have a vaccine right now, and that includes people that are eligible for the vaccine and those under 12. So again, 37%. That means really roughly 60% uh, of the population is still able to pass around the virus. So Brian, Dr. Pate told me that for us to really see an improvement, to see a different, we want to see probably 60-65% of everybody vaccinated. He says beyond that, 80 to 85% would really be the, the greatest goal. And he says at that point, COVID would still be around, but it'd be more of a nuisance than really what we're dealing with now. And I know that was the goal from the very beginning was this 80-85%, but with these numbers still stagnant and below 50 and below 30 of the entire population, I don't know how much reality that could possibly be, but we'll have to see if we get approval for these vaccination ages to be dropping a little bit lower as we get through this year. Okay, so now that the city of Boise is requiring everyone to wear masks inside city buildings, some businesses are starting to hop on that trend as well. What about large gathering places? You know, places like concerts, rodeos, festivals, events that usually mean, well, hundreds of people sitting elbow to elbow, usually inside. New CDC guidance, they're not going to change any current protocols. And as Katya Stepovic found out, some venues are now waiting on local health and state guidelines before making any drastic changes. A venue that typically brings in anywhere from 350 to 400,000 people a year is back in full swing this summer after having to shut down for months. The, the general public, they're very excited to come out to live events again. I mean, events are you know, creating memories or experiences that you live with for a lifetime. Andrew Luther, general manager of the Ford Idaho Center in Napa, says the venue has been going strong and has been able to stay open because of sanitation practices, even without requiring masks. And to this day, he says the center has not been linked to any direct contact tracing stemming from events. You know, people aren't really wearing masks that often. You know, I certainly see people who do, and that's that's great. And I see people who choose not to, and you know, that's okay too. If people are ever you know uncomfortable being at the venue, we'd like to offer to help and provide them masks, or you know, or even receive them if necessary. But with COVID cases creeping up and new CDC guidance to mask up, will the Ford Idaho Center do the same? You know, we're really not planning on changing much. We've been recommending masks for vaccinated or unvaccinated for quite some time now. You know, there's never been a, a full mandate in Canyon County. But according to the CDC's COVID data tracker, Canyon County is in the red category, which means transmission level is high. Still, Luther says they would like to follow guidance from the state and local health districts. If Canyon County or our Southwest District Health um, for that matter, came forward and said, hey, we really think you guys should require masks. Is that something you would adopt into your protocols? It'd be a large conversation, but if the, if the powers that be we are so very much suggesting the requirement of masks, uh, it's something we'd definitely take under consideration. So until then, operations will continue and current COVID protocols will remain. Masks recommended, not required, and social distancing or capacity limits not enforced. We're employing up to 500 part-time people to produce something of a, of a large caliber. And not to even mention the ripple effects of people filling up the hotels and restaurants around the venue. And if those go away, those things grind to a halt too. So it's not just us hosting events. It's really, you know, pushing, pushing the economy to move forward. So when we take a look at CDC's COVID-19 data tracking, you can see that Canyon County moved from the substantial level, which is the orange level, to the high level, which is the red level that we see in just one day. But Brian, as we know, and as you talked about yesterday, the CDC and the state seem to be tracking their numbers a little differently. Can you explain that? Yeah, and it's even changed from yesterday where we were in the substantial and ADA in Canyon County, now into the high, as you mentioned. But that's been the problem with all of this the entire time. As I spoke with Health and Welfare yesterday, they said this discrepancy in data is something they've been dealing with for the entire pandemic. 
things like inconsistent reporting. Some places reporting daily, some others reporting weekly. All this data coming from districts, counties, labs. It's never really been consistent criteria. Some districts and counties have stopped reporting regularly at all. State data sometimes pulled at different times, meaning if it's later than a health district compiles their numbers, well, those numbers can be added to the next day's tally or even next week's tally. And so it's just, again, very inconsistent. Then there's this one size fits all approach to data, like this cases per 100,000 stat that we like to throw around. I spoke with South Central District Health yesterday about this, and they said it's not exactly an accurate way to apply that per 1,000 stat when you have some counties that have less or fewer than 1,000 people. Let's say you get four cases in a place like Camas County where about 900 people live. If you extrapolate that to per 100,000, it seems to make it worse than it actually is, which is why all eight counties in South Central District Health are listed as minimal risk on the district's website right now. While on the CDC site, Twin Falls County is at a high risk. So there are all kinds, again, of inconsistency factor, inconsistent factors that go into this data, and it's been a problem since the beginning. But bottom line is keep a look at your local data collection sites, the districts, the uh, state numbers. They're going to give you the most accurate because some of those data, some of those numbers are actually get doubled up that the federal numbers, they don't, they don't pull those out. They don't double check them. They just gather them. Local uh, entities tend to double check them and throw out anything that is inconsistent or doubled up. So just keep looking there. Making it backstage put a Boise guitar maker out in front for several rock and roll legends, which makes the loss of one of those legends so hard to take today. Have you saved our number yet? Well, here it is, just in case you need to put it back in your phone. 208-321-5614. You want to have it handy during the show, like right now maybe, so you can send us whatever comments or questions you have. And yes, we'll even take your complaints. You can tell us about it, but you know, kind of in a constructive way would be helpful. And stick around, we're going to share some of our favorites at the end of the show. It was January 1984, and ZZ Top was in the middle of their Eliminator tour. You know, legs, give me all your lovin', sharp dressed man. Yeah, they were big, big time by then. The tour stopped in Boise to play a two night stand in the then two year old BSU Pavilion, now known as Extra Mile Arena. And as the story goes, Boise guitar maker John Bolin was able to sneak backstage and introduce himself to Billy Gibbons, the band's lead guitarist. John said Billy told him he had 10 minutes to show him what he's got. And John returned with an appropriately painted candy apple red guitar and matching bass that he'd made in his shop. That two minute tryout turned into a 20 minute jam session by Billy, which then turned into a business deal for John within 24 hours. And that turned into a 35 year plus relationship that John says is more like family than business. A family that lost one of its brothers. John said Billy called him this morning to tell him Dusty Hill, the bass player for the band, died in his sleep last night in Houston. He was 72. John was too broken up to speak with us on camera today, said he was just numb from the news. 
So instead, we tracked down this story Alice Newton did with John Boland back in 2003 about how a Boise guitar maker played into the hands of some in rock and roll's greatest legends. I just uh, have a real love for guitars and uh, started thinking, wow, somebody has to make these things. For 25 years, that's exactly what John Bolin has been doing, designing and building guitars in his Boise studio. But his career really took off about 17 years ago, when Bolin had his first brush with fame. ZZ Top played a show here in 86, and a friend of mine had this idea. He said, let's, let's put together something. Let's make a guitar, and let's see if we can show it to him. Let's do something. And so we did. For two weeks, Bolin worked night and day designing a guitar for Billy Gibbons, and somehow managed to get it backstage the night of ZZ Top's concert. The gamble paid off. A couple of days later, I got a phone call, and off we went. We ordered the first guitar in 86, and we're somewhere around 100, 105 or something that we've made for him and Dustin. Mm -hmm. Word spread fast and far in the music industry. Among many others, Bolin made guitars for Aerosmith, Stevie Ray Vaughan, the Dixie Chicks, and Steve Miller. Some selling for more than $10,000. But it wasn't until this year that Bolin feels he really reached for the stars. I've had this idea to build Keith Richards a guitar for about five years, and I've, I've had some parts kind of stashed for it. <laughs> and uh, finally, I kind of got in the mood to do it. But this is not necessarily an industry where, if you build it, they will come. The Stones are considered one of the best rock bands in history, with access to more guitars than they know what to do with. It's unheard of for, for the Rolling Stones to pick up brand new guitars. It's unheard of. It's unspoken. They do not do this. But they did. This February, in the middle of the Worldwide Live Licks Tour, Keith Richards and Ronnie Wood switched to bowling guitars during the group's signature song. It just worked. I mean, the colors and the inlay, and we did a lot of gold and silver. Um, we did this wild um, violet pink color for it. It was a big chance, and he loved it. He said it was bloody brilliant. And it was a brilliant opportunity for this accomplished guitar maker to fulfill a dream. The Rolling Stones really gave me my satisfaction. And I know that sounds kind of cliche, but it did. Allison Uten. It makes me very proud to know that they play my guitars. Idaho's News Channel 7. Well, that satisfaction for John all started with ZZ Top. And I know in that story he said it was 86, but I double checked the tour dates and it was January of 1984. You know, time kind of plays tricks with our memory a little bit. Well, the Texas Blues Rock Band was welcomed to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2004. And during their induction performance, they played bowling guitars. Over the years, John told us he guesses he's made more than 300 guitars for Billy and Dusty at his shop at 36th and Hill Road here in Boise. If they ordered five, John said, he had to make 10 because, as you remember, they always matched. John told me Dusty carried a quiet strength, and he last saw him during the band's 50th anniversary tour in June of 2019, when he and his wife hand-delivered some new guitars to the group. In fact, he had just shipped out his latest guitars to the band on Monday. John said those guitars were delivered today.
All right, in between legislative sessions, it's a good time to give the old state capitol building a whole once over. Deep cleaning, maybe improvement projects, whatever. However, this summer, those undertakings may be overseen by lawmakers since they are technically only in recess and not adjourned. In fact, next week, members of the House will return for an ethics committee hearing looking into the two complaints made against Representative Priscilla Giddings of Whitebird. Those complaints are based on Representative Giddings posting of the identity of the 19 year old intern to her social media account. An intern who, by the way, also allegedly a sexual assault survivor. We're going to have more on that next week. But when those lawmakers and some members of the public return next week for that hearing, they'll likely be walking into a construction zone. Frank texted us this picture yesterday from inside the Idaho State Capitol building. Quite the scaffolding going up all the way into the dome, as you can see. So yeah, quite a big project. Crews are working on replacing the glass in the Capitol dome. So the entire rotunda from the basement all the way up to the top is going to be closed until November. And if you've been there and looked up into the dome, you've likely seen the glass that's sitting up there, the glass that's in question. It looks like it has chicken wire in it. If you look closely and it looks like well, I guess it does because yeah, it, it does have chicken wire in it. Keith Rich or Keith Reynolds, the director of the Department of Administ Administration, told our partners with the Idaho Press. It's an historic type of shatterproof glass that preceded modern safety glass. Reynolds said those pieces were formed in sheets. Two pieces on top of each other were laid together and then they put chicken wire in between. So it seems the heat has been having an effect on those as well with those pieces starting to separate. So now they need to replace them before one of those panels well, falls to the floor. Now here's the catch. The glass needs to be exactly the same. Otherwise, there'd be a big difference in the light that comes in. And normally that would be okay. But Idaho's Capitol building, nicknamed the Capitol of Light, well, the nickname came from John Turtlet, the original Capitol architect who wrote, quote, the great white light of conscience must be allowed to shine and by its interior illumination make clear the path of duty, end quote. And basically, this is a historic preservation project. So the glass needs to be replaced exactly as it is today. So the Capitol is going to remain open through construction, but some areas may be temporarily closed. The Capitol Commission approved the project last November at a cost of about
All right, our focus the last couple of days has been the inconsistency when it comes to COVID reporting federally, statewide. Terry has this to say about that. There are sources, many sources of COVID data reporting inconsistencies, but reporting cases per 1,000, not one of them. That metric allows us to compare LA to CUNA, which is what we probably should do, which is why South Central District Health uses that 10,000 per approach. I'm vaccinated. Why do I have to wear a mask to protect someone who elects not to get vaccinated? Seems like I've done my part. If they want to get vaccinated, wouldn't he be here again? That's the same sentiment sent in by Jody. I'm vaccinated. Why is it my problem to protect the people who choose not to be vaccinated? I guess that kind of goes back to the beginning of this pandemic when the vaccine wasn't available. You kind of do what you can to protect your neighbor, right?